when I was 26, my firstborn was born, and five hours after an emergency C-section, and he was in a transition nursery on basically a feeding tube and a respirator. The doctor comes in at 1 a.m. and says, we see signs of Down syndrome in your baby. And I was so medicated <laughs> that I looked at Gabe, and we kind of made eye contact, and then we just rolled back over and fell asleep. I hadn't held him or seen him at that moment and didn't even know how to process that. I had actually had a false negative saying that everything was okay, so I'd never even given it a second thought from early on in my pregnancy. But the next day, I'm in a wheelchair and, and wheel downstairs and got to see him for the first time. And he was hooked to all these tubes, and they looked at me and said, he doesn't have a heart defect, which is remarkable because one like 50% of kids with Down syndrome do. And so I thought, well, maybe he does have Down syndrome. Maybe he doesn't. It takes several days to get the results of something like that. So, six days later, on my husband's birthday, I got a call and said it's positive. And uh, in that moment, I had a hard shower cry, like some people can relate to, where you just kind of go, life looks different now. And we quickly got dressed and got in the car, and I remember driving back to the hospital because Cade was still in the NICU. He was only four and a half pounds at birth, and he had to stay there until he gained weight. I held him that day, and he looks at me with eyes that says, are you going to love me for me? Or are you going to love me for what I can accomplish and what I can do and what milestones I can hit so that you can think you're a good mom? And I realized that that was the first glimpse I ever had of unconditional love, that no matter what you do, you're loved because of who you are. And growing up, I had done a lot of striving. I had done a lot of performing to prove my worth and to feel loved and accepted and affirmed. And my son's life just shook that and turned it upside down. And all of a sudden, it changed the way I saw the world and the way I saw other people. And Cade now is 12, and he has completely rocked our world. We have two other kids that are 10 and 8. And they're growing up with a vantage point on life that all people are worth much. It's so beautiful. I'm so grateful for it. I'm, I'm grateful that he was my first. I'm grateful that my other two get to grow up and be his siblings and, and understand compassion in ways that took me years to really know. And the beauty is Kate in New York City is showing is really confronting this in New York City because as you walk down streets, people don't want to make eye contact. People don't want to wave or say hi, but Kate, Kate doesn't let that happen. He'll get in your face and be like, hi, on an elevator, hi. And if they don't respond, he won't stop. He's relentless. He'll be like, hi. And finally, they're like, hi. It's just creating this awareness that these lives are important and they bring something to this world that we desperately need and I'm grateful that I've had a modeling of love and Jesus to me looks like one that wants to meet us in wherever we are like meet us where we are with our shame without judgment with this embrace of love and all of a sudden when we feel that we want to respond to it we want to be free with that Such a moving story. <laughs> I'm like bawling back over here. Um, it, gets, it gets me every time. And I, I'm just understanding God's love is, is beyond what we can even imagine. And uh, when our kids teach us that, it's like it blows our box away, doesn't it? Um, I don't know where you're coming in from this morning, how your week has been. Um, but I do want you to know this is a place of love and grace and kindness uh, for a matter of where you're coming in this morning. Um, 
one of the big, big things we're talking about today is how someone can transition and move from feeling very far from God, feeling like he's way off in the distance, like you can't even get near to him, to come into a place where you're experiencing a closeness with him like you've never experienced before. And much of the way this happens, this bridge between someone who feels very far, maybe that's you this morning, maybe you came here this morning and you're like, this church thing, I'm just going through the motions, I don't know where God's at, I don't know what's happening. Um, maybe that's you this morning. How do we move from that space to another place that says, I'm experiencing the closeness of God? And I honestly will be right in the middle of that. That, that mess of life is unconditional love. A love without strings. No strings attached. And this is the powerful love of God that is present here in this room today. In this community of people. And I want you to experience that in fresh ways this morning. Uh, And so, you know, we're in this series called The Secret to a Good Life. And uh, we're talking about some really important things that are related just to life itself. And the big idea for this whole little series we're in is that the secret to a good life is a person. It's Jesus. The irony is if we make happiness and the good life our pursuit, like that's the goal is the get happiness goal, we're never going to get it. Uh, We're never going to get there because all the things we usually go to for that kind of fix in life, happiness, whatever you may want to call it, um, are temporary things. They don't last. They wear out. Uh, they, don't, they don't produce what we want in life. And so if we're going to say, what's the secret to this good life? It is a person. It is a real relationship with a person that you and I get to live and do life with beyond just a theological position, which there are theological things about Jesus that we have to agree on and believe. But he is a person, not a, not a statement. And so this is foundational to how we get this. Jesus isn't just a gateway into something else. He is the good life. Last week we were talking about joy and about how we enjoy Jesus. And I wonder if there's anyone coming in this morning with uh, a limp from wrestling with Jesus this past week. I encouraged you last week if you were here to say, I want you to wrestle with God to give you what he says he's going to give you. When Jesus says, I want you to have my joy in you. And he wrestlers this today. Like I wrestled with God this week. So give me that joy. If you're still wrestling, that's fine. I'm still wrestling. I'm not going to give up till he gives it to me. Because it's him. And I want him more than anything. And I want you to have him as well. So today we're in the, in the third part of this series that we're in. And we're going to be looking at a passage from 1 John chapter 4. You can find your Bibles. Uh, open up to 1 John 4 on your device or the Bible in front of you. And if we look at what Jesus says about life, he's pretty straightforward about life itself. He doesn't really, you know, mince things. He's pretty straightforward. In John 10.10, he simply says, you know, there's an enemy who comes who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And he says, I came to give you life. And I give it abundantly. That's Jesus' take on life. He says, there's someone who comes and wants to take everything, steal, destroy, Everything. And Jesus says, I came to give you life. And he says, I'm that life. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning who is, you know, wondering when the last time you said something like this. Man, I'm just living life to the fullest right now. <laughs> Most likely you said something like, life is full. <laughs> By which you meant, I am stressed. <laughs> Work is going bonkers. When am I going to get a break? When is this thing going to happen for me? There seems to be this huge gap between what Jesus is offering to us and actually what we're actually experiencing in life. And we want to continue to close that gap. How do, how do we move from where we are to a new place? So as I've, I've mentioned to you, it, this, this message is particularly focused on the person who's here this morning who doesn't feel close to God. Like you just, your week has been such a week, or you just, you don't even know God. You're here and you're like, I don't know what this thing is all about. This message is particularly focused on you, okay? So I, I want you to understand, how do you move from feeling very distant from what Jesus is offering to you to actually how you're experiencing life? And, and how do we move from one place to the other? Now, I know there are other people here who are feeling close to God. You came in and you were like, I'm doing great, feel close to God. This message is for you too. 
for two different ways. To remind you how you moved from feeling far from God to feeling close. And to give you a challenge at the end. But my focus for the next few minutes is on the person who's here that says, I don't feel close to God. And I guarantee you there's probably someone here who feels that way this morning. This message is for you, <laughs> you could say. First John chapter 4, I'll read for us starting verse 13 down to verse 21. That's what the writer says. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Here's the thing I want you to know this morning. You are deeply, completely, and perfectly loved by Jesus. You can, you can know that love today, not just at a cognitive level. You know, he says, and you hear this word, know, later on in verse you know, 16, it says, come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. It's not just, oh, I heard the pastor this morning talk about love. Great. No, it is saying an experience, firsthand experience, intimate knowledge of God's love for you, deeply, perfectly, completely loved by Jesus. And if you're going to make that move from feeling far from God to being near for him, that bridge, that kind of in-between zone, you could say, is this love feast of God for you. And I want you to know it, not just in your head, but in your heart. I want you to come to believe in it, as he says here. To know this love, to believe in it. To believe in something is to lean upon it. You came in this morning into this room, uh, and you believe that that pew you're sitting in it was going to hold up your weight and all the people that are sitting around you. You leaned on that pew. In similar fashion here, when he says the word, believe the love of God, it is saying, I'm going to lean on that thing. I'm going to trust in that thing. I, I, I know it, I'm experiencing it, and now I am leaning upon it with my whole force of my whole life. And that is how someone can move. You can move from feeling far from God to being near to him this morning. We want to make that transition, that movement in our life. If we look at verses 13 to 16, what we see is that Jesus has drawn near to you and he's drawing near to you right now. In this place, I, I, I honestly believe that the presence of Jesus in this room is drawing you to himself and being drawn, you, you being drawn to him. And I can understand that very particularly because when it says here, God is love in verse 16. It is an action-oriented movement of God to you. We get into this funny thing of thinking that love is just an emotion, right? I feel love, which is part of love. But when it says here that God is love, it doesn't say God feels loving. He doesn't feel love. It says is, is, right? You see it in the past. He is love, which is telling us that it is the essential nature and character of God is love. And yes, he feels particular things. Of course, he has emotions. But his divine passions are different than human passions. When he loves, he loves perfectly. And it comes from his character, the nature of his being. It emanates from his core, out of himself, from what he's trying to do. It runs deep and it runs rich in who he is 
in his character and his nature. This is the love that God has for you and for me when he says he is love, action, and emotion. Now, deep down, maybe some of you struggle with that concept. Everything I just said kind of went on a riff, all right? It was riffing, you could say. We struggle with that. I've struggled with that. Maybe you're here this morning and say, I don't, I don't feel love. I don't, I don't feel that. Reality is, it doesn't matter too much what you feel at the moment. This is a fact. And our faith is based on fact and let the feelings come later or in subsequent, right along with it. We have to focus on the fact. The fact of the matter is it says God is love. And many of the reasons we struggle with this idea is that we think we have to perform for God. Similar to what the, what the lady was saying in the, in the film. We think something like this, and maybe you've thought this. This is certainly coming from my experience. I think if I just perform and do the right thing, then that will fuel God's love for me. We think if I just pull the right lever, I, I just, I just kind of do the right thing. Thing, I, I, I kind of push the right buttons, then the vending machine of God's love will just kind of pop out what I'm looking for. Uh, to use another illustration or example, sometimes we conceive of God's love like going to a carnival game. <laughs> you step up to the counter, grab the bean bag, and just chuck it at those bowling pins, right? Just throw it at them. Because why? Because we want that prize that's on the wall. <laughs> want, that, want that teddy bear. And we think, well, if I just kind of step up to the counter, I do the right thing, I just chuck it down there, I knock down the pins, then I'll get God's love. I'll, I'll, I'll get it, and then he'll give it to me. Friends, that is a wrong way to conceive of God's love for you. It's not based on your performance. The word here for love in this passage is the word agape. It is a fantastic word. There's lots of different words in the Bible for love. The one here is agape. And it means, very simply, there's an intentional action of God, the motivation of God in sending Jesus, as verse 13 13 says, is love. Now, this is essential for us to understand because what this means is that the measure and the quality of God's love for you is not dependent upon you, the receiver, but on him as the giver. This is good news. Because it doesn't mean, well, I, how am I perform or don't perform? What I measure up to or don't measure up to? He's saying, no, this agape love that is being poured out into your life because of the Father sending Jesus to be the Savior of the world, that love is not dependent upon you as the one who is receiving it, but on the character and the nature that God is love. This is amazing. We're just the vessels that's receiving what he's given. He doesn't give it to the measure of how much I deserve it, how much you deserve it. So if we want to move from that movement from feeling far to feeling close, we need to get the concepts right. You may not feel as if you're a, a lovable person. Maybe you walked in this morning, you feel like I feel ashamed. Gary, you don't have no idea what I did last night. You have no idea what I did to my family this week, what I did to my neighbor, what I did to my colleague. You don't know what I did. I don't feel very loved. I don't feel great. I feel unwanted. I feel like an outcast. Let the truth of this kind of just kind of permeate into the core of your being. It's hard to imagine this, isn't it? Someone being drawn to you not dependent upon you as the one who's receiving it, but on the one who's giving it to you. This is good news. The motivational force of God's love coming at you because of his character, out of the overflow of his heart for you. Sometimes why we can say the divine passions of God are different than the, than the passions of human beings. He is divinely passionate, never wavering, never changing. We change all the time, don't we? 
Jesus wants you close to him. He wants you right close to his heart. He's drawing near to you right now. In those places of your life where you don't feel lovable, he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to send my love to you. I want, I want you to see this in the text because I'm not just making this stuff up. I, I'm showing you in the text. You look at verse 13, and he says this, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. Okay, so there's a verse in Romans that talks about how God's love is being poured into our hearts through the spirit of God that he's given to us. So if, if those of you that are following Jesus, you have the Spirit of God in you, this is, this is how he's pouring love into us, through the Spirit of God. It's similar to what it's saying in verse 13. Then verse 14 says this, We have seen and we have testified, what? That the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. He has drawn near to you. And he's drawing near to you right now this morning. The evidence is when what the Father has done in sending the Son to be your Savior. The Savior of the world. So in those places where we feel like we're just distant and away, those are the places where, where God shows up. He's I'm gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up in that place on the turf of your life where you don't feel so great, unwanted. He said, I'm showing up in that place with love. Jesus wants to be close to you, either for the first time or again. So we look down at verse 17. Verse 17 is a fantastic verse, and it's talking about this continual love of God. And he says, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. They were fierce, has not been perfected in love. When he's talking about the word perfected, it's not talking about as if there's uh, flawless or faultlessness. The word for perfected is talking about fullness of love. Fullness of love being poured out into us. Fullness of God's love being poured out into us. And the result you can see in the verses I just read is that fear evaporates. Fear evaporates and confidence and security become evident. You see what he says there, the perfect love, he cast out fear. Fear disappears completely because fear, he says, has to do with punishment. And he says when, when love is being poured into your life, the fullness of God's love coming into your life, you know what evaporates is all that fear, all that shame, all that sense of feeling unwanted, feeling like an outcast, feeling like you don't belong, and all that just kind of evaporates because he says that has to do with punishment. So we may think I'm all those things I just mentioned, unwanted, unloved. God just wants to squash me. The truth is that Jesus took that punishment for you. So that fear can evaporate. And then what comes in when that, when that fear of punishment just kind of goes away because we see Jesus died on the cross for me. To be my savior, the savior of the world. My savior, your savior. That fear evaporates and what comes right in is confidence for the day of judgment. It says there you have confidence for the day of judgment. So in the last day, when you cross from this life into the next and you stand before your maker, what confidence will you have? It is the love of God. Trusting in that. Leaning upon that. Experiencing it. Say, I have confidence now Confidence in the future, security comes sweeping in. Friends, you are never too far gone. You're never out of the reach of God's love, out of his grace. And as you learn and we learn to know it and to believe in that love, you and I are welcomed into a new position with God. Positionally changed from being far to being near to him. And if that's you this morning, I want you to make that transition. That movement in your life because of God's love being poured out for you. But what about those here this morning who are like, I, I already feel close to God. I understand, every, Pastor, I understand everything you just said. I'm, I'm already enjoying that position. What about, what about me? <laughs> well, what about you? <laughs> Look at verses 20 and 21. 
for the one who already feels close to God. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now, the logic of the passage is pretty simple, right? It's pretty, I mean, I, I cannot stand up here and say, I love God and then turn around and hate you. And neither can you do that with anybody else. Say, I love God, I follow him, I, I love him. And all of a sudden you turn around and you just, <laughs> you hate other people. It's inconsistent, he's saying. You can't do that. So if, I, I want to just tell you this real quick. The, the one who feels the love of God and is experiencing the way he's describing here needs to be the one who's showing that love to other people. This world is a loveless place, isn't it? Loveless place. It's brutal, the world we live in. Not this place. Not this community. This needs to be a place, and it is going to be a place, where the love that we feel is going to be the love that we show. When it says here that, you know, we, we can't say we love God and hate our brother, we, we sometimes get into this trap thinking, well, I don't actively hate anybody. I, I don't, I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and say, oh, yeah, anyone hate anybody? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Unless <laughs> we're going to have a time of confession. <laughs> Maybe we need to. I don't know. But we can sometimes think, well, hate is just this active kind of just seething inside that says, I hate it. <laughs> you know, like, nah. I think hate is just simply indifference. It's different, right? It's just simply saying, well, a lack of love is just a, a lack of indifference. And I, you know, it's an uncaring heart. It's, an un, it's a heart that's unmoved. It's a heart that says, I see someone in pain. I see what they're going through. But you know, I don't really care. So I don't have to actively hate someone. It just means I have to be, you know, non-sympathetic. I don't understand what they're going through. So I don't really care. I'm just going to not care and be indifferent about them. Those of us that say, I love God, cannot walk away and say, I'm indifferent to the pain of other people. It is inconsistent, and it's inconsistent because, like father, like son and daughter. The father's love is here in this place. And the love that he's shown us in this passage is the self-sacrificial love for the good of another person. The quality of that love, right? Right? That's how we can define love. Self-sacrifice for the good of another person. That's the love he's shown to you and to me for our good. He self-sacrificed. Jesus coming, dying for us, self-sacrificial, because there's a benefit to you and to me. When he's saying here that we we need to be loving as we've been loved, so to speak, that, that the love that Jesus has shown to us is a love that ought to flow through us to other people. Like father, like son, and daughter. Self-sacrificial love for the good of another person. So let me just encourage you. If, you, if you've made that move. You, you, you're just like, I, I feel close to God. I, I, I feel that. Can you and I turn the other direction and say, who is the other person on the other side who feels distant? It may be the person you're sitting next to. It may be the person that you're going to interact with outside of this place. I don't know. There's people all over this world who don't feel close to God. But those of us that feel close to him and we're, we're in that positional place where we understand what's happened, we need to turn and look at the person who says, let me incarnate myself into their life and go to where they're most pain. And I enter in with self-sacrificial love. We take the action. We move to people who are hurting, feel shame feel like they're outcast, feel like they don't belong. And we go the extra mile. Self-sacrificial love that will benefit the good of another person. That's just the love we've been shown. So that's the love we have to give to one another. So that's the challenge, the encouragement for those of us that have already made that transition. What can we do to show love? The secret to a good life is your love life, you could say. You are deeply, completely, and perfectly loved by Jesus. Before I close, and we're going to sing a song, I just want to 
I want to say something about just our church family. Um, in the past two weeks, we've had four people pass away. Uh, some you know about, some you maybe not know about. Um, and so I, I think that when we think about people who are hurting and in pain, what can we do to self-sacrifice for the good of another person? How can we enter into that place of pain, losing a loved one? Uh, there are families here that are, that are hurting. Ryan Sunberg um, passed away. Some of you don't know Ryan at all, but he battled for a decade or so with, with real physical problems and struggles, and uh, he passed away. He, 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 friends, he's in a better spot than the rest of us. But the family's hurting, right? They, they hurt. They, they, loss of a loved one. They're grieving. This afternoon, we, we're, we'll have another funeral here. Um, Wayne Solomon passed away uh, during the first service last week. He, they lived very close by. It wasn't here in the building. But, so Connie and her family, are, they're grieving. They're in a place of pain. There's others in our church family who are in the same spot. And I just want to encourage us. As a, this is some family business, you could say. How do we show love? Can we do that? Can, can we go the extra mile just for a little bit and just show love? Now let the Lord lead you in how you're supposed to do that. But friends, we say we love God. Let's turn to the one who doesn't feel that right now. Hurting and pain. Let's, let's, let's incarnate ourselves into those people's lives. You are deeply, completely, and perfectly loved. Let me pray for us and then Todd will come up and Lead us in a final song together. Father, it is our desire as we read your word that we would comprehend with greater depth the love that you've given to us and that that comprehension would lead towards transformation. Father, I pray for us that in a world that is full of hatred and pain, that this community of believing people would be marked by extraordinary love. So that when people kind of poke at us and they look at us and they look through the, 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 over the fence and they wonder what's going on in this place, that the quality which they would see is love, your love. Would you change us as a people? To love one another with greater sacrifice and greater enjoyment. Thank you that you're here this morning. As you're changing us, you're moving us. We ask God for you to do that more and more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.